The last quartet is called Little Getting. It's my favorite quartet. <laughs> and if I don't have time some in, in some semesters to teach all of the quartets, I really enjoy teaching this. Perhaps it's a little bit like only teaching Paradiso when you teach the Divine Comedy. But the end of the quartets, this last quartet is beautiful. Um, I wish I could just read the whole thing and we could just enjoy the pleasure of the quartet itself. But we will have, uh, not resolutions, but we will have all of these different pieces being brought together and starting to make sense or feel as though they make sense. There's a certain kind of poetic knowledge that goes, transcends the reason here in, the, in this last quartet that we'll look at. So I want to walk through uh, the poem itself, this last movement, and pay attention to what the way the fire now takes on a new meaning in this final section. As we've seen, we've had Burnt Norton representing the element of air, and then looking at East Coker, uh, the earth, the humus, the humility, um, the old world, right, being in awe of the ancestors that came before. We have dry salvages. Ironically, the dry salvages describes a particular place uh, of water, and it's the water element. And then Little Gidding, and Elliot is writing Little Gidding um, while the bombing uh, uh, is taking place in World War II. This is uh, 1942, and you have the Germans that are, are daily blitzing London, and Eliot himself was working for Faber and Faber, and he would have been sitting on the rooftop watching for the bombs to fall so that he could alert people about where the fires were. So in that sense, he sounds like he almost takes on a saint's role of um, the 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 watcher from the watchtower, right, watching for the fires. And yet uh, the same kind of destructiveness that is intended by the Germans over Britain, Eliot renders here in Little Gidding as also Pentecostal and purgatorial, um, a redemptive way of viewing fire here in this last quartet. We'll also look at the way that he resolves the idea of journey and um, the wrestling he had with words in East Coker, the meanings of words, does poetry matter to us when it's not itself material? How does he resolve that idea of communication in, in Little Gidding? And then the cost of grace. Um, finally, these dead souls that were brought up earlier on in the poem, Augustine and Dante, and now in, these, in this final quartet, he'll also dialogue with Julian and with Herbert. And we'll see the ways that these voices of the past become what it is that we know. And Eliot, of course, now becomes part of what we know. Little Getting Opens Midwinter Spring is its own season. What we have in the opening of Little Getting is this contrast, right? Um, midwinter spring. What, is, what does that even mean? <laughs> so he's returning us to these ideas of seasons as we saw um, East Coker talking about November and then um, April being mentioned in, um, in Dry Self Ages. And now we have midwinter, but it's a midwinter spring. Uh, septurnal, septurnal though sodden towards sundown, suspended in time between pole and tropic. He's playing with these contrasts for some reason, and we have to kind of walk through to understand why. When the short day is brightest with frost and fire, the brief sun flames the ice on ponds and ditches, and windless cold that is the heart's heat reflecting in a watery mirror, a glare that is blindness in the early afternoon. So what is he doing here with the contrast between the hot and the cold, the Pentecostal fire in the dark time of year, between melting and freezing, the soul sap quivers, there is no earth smell or smell of living thing. This is the springtime, but not in time's covenant. Now the hedgerow is blanched for an hour with the transitory blossom of snow, a bloom more sudden than that of summer, neither budding nor fading, not in the scheme of generation. Where is the summer, the unimaginable zero summer? And we almost just have to hold out. We have to, to wait and try to understand what he's bringing us to, um, this, this sun and this ice, this heat and this cold. 
in some ways we're going to begin to understand that he's talking about spiritual and literal things taking place simultaneously, right? Um, in, in some ways, the lack of what we found in dry salvages, ages, the wasteland, the emptiness is that coldness that is felt. And yet what will happen when the flames, um, when the heat take place in this, this midwinter period, right? When spring kind of breaks forth through this spiritual midwinter. We hear again the movement of the journey that we started in the beginning with Burt Norton. If you came this way, taking the route you would likely take from the place you would be likely to come from. If you came this way in May time, you would find the hedges white again. And so we have a meditation again on time and how the place would look different. Little getting itself would look different in different times when you would come. And He's also talking about things that have happened in that place, that the place itself retains kind of the resonances of those, of those times, um, the stories or the history of Little Gidding, and um, the meanings that, that those stories have are, are in the material of the city itself. They're in Little Gidding, and he can, in a, in a way, feel them. It's kind of like when you walk into a house and you've heard that it's been haunted and you feel like you can experience the ghosts of the place or um, maybe your, your mother's house and how uh, there are certain memories you have that almost feel like they're, they're bodied forth in the walls, that they, the memories take on such a presence for you even though those things aren't happening. You could be in the middle of summer and go to your grandmother's house and you remember winter so that it feels present in that place, even though you're there in the middle of summer. And that's what Eliot's doing, describing uh, Little Gidding, describing this place. He says, uh, and it's, he's talking about a church, you are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity or carry a report. So don't be a tourist. Um, don't be someone who is coming into this place to, to deconstruct and take it apart. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. This is a church that feels the old prayers that took place here, where those prayers were met and answered. And prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind or the sound of the voice praying. And what the dead had no speech for when living, they can tell you being dead. The communication of the dead is tongued with fire beyond the language of the living. Here the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, never and always. So we have once again the Kairos and the Kronos coming into full meeting here. The first movement of Little Getting was picking up our conversation from the previous quartets, looking at um, fire and air and earth and water and those elements and now the journey that we began um, through these mysteries and through these questions through learning how to hear and how to listen what kind of language we should be speaking and now we are coming into um, not the resolution meaning answers but a resolution to this journey uh, a destination place in little getting this is a key movement in, in this final quartet. This is movement two. And so I want to begin with this section. It picks up the conversation left over from Dante. As we saw, Dante was in the middle of the journey. And um, Eliot was, in a sense, resonating with Dante's spiritual pilgrimage and, as he spoke to the dead and the kind of communication you could have with the dead through their writings that can help you understand these eternal questions that you're still asking in your particular moment. In the uncertain hour before the morning, near the ending of the interminable night. Isn't that a beautiful, right, capturing of the, of the paradox here? Um, the movement between morning and night, between um, the sun rising and uh, the, the night ending here, this, this dark and light that he's been he's been thinking about and meditating on and showing us and of course it resonates as well the darkness of the dark night of the soul and uh, the light of the fire that's coming at the recurrent end of the unending after the dark dove with the flickering tongue so here we have the holy spirit right 
had passed below the horizon of his homing while the dead leaves, do you remember the dead leaves from Burt Norton, the resonance of Aeneid, of those, of those souls from Aeneid 6 um, that, we, that we heard before, which of course is also a passage from the Divine Comedy in, um, in Canto 3 of the Divine Comedy in Inferno, when um, Virgil is about to arrive, uh, the same mention of Aeneid, um, the dead souls being like these, these leaves comes up as well. So while the dead leaves still rattled on like tin over asphalt where no other sound was between three districts, whence the smoke arose, I met one walking, loitering, and hurried. We're back to the paradox. We're back to the contrast between the cold and the heat, um, between these things that seem so disparate and unable to be combined, right? This impossible union as what was mentioned about the incarnation in um, Dry Salvages, the impossible union that is possible or does happen in the incarnation. So we have loitering and hurried, as if blown toward me like the metal leaves before the urban dawn wind unresisting. And as I fixed upon the downturned face that pointed scrutiny with which we challenged the first met stranger in the waning dusk, I caught the sudden look of some dead master whom I had known, forgotten, half recalled, both one and many. Do you hear the, how the language has repeated itself so much through this poem here? The person that we have met is the first met stranger and yet dead master, right? So both familiar and unfamiliar, both one and many. So we have this idea of the, the Trinitarian idea of both one and three. Um, so there's a paradox that's being brought forth, but this is a, a dead master. Uh, could be Augustine, could be Dante, could be Ezra Pound. And we'll see here, we have the compound ghost. So we have some possibility that it was Ezra Pound, which of course Eliot had known since 1914. Um, who was a, a big mover in Eliot's career, but also the, the resonance of Dante is, is pretty thick here. Um, the brown baked features, remember the brown god, uh, the river god from Dry Salve Ages, both intimate and unidentifiable. In some ways, this should make us think of the resurrected Christ too, who was both familiar to his disciples and yet they didn't recognize him at first. So I assumed a double part and cried and heard another's voice cry, what, are you here? Okay, that line <laughs> should sound exactly like Divine Comedy. When Dante goes down into Inferno, he actually sees um, uh, Bertine, um, oh, uh, Brunetta uh, Latini. <laughs> I need to start that line over. <laughs> uh, okay, what? Are you here? Those words should sound exactly like uh, when Dante descends into Inferno and he sees his master teacher, Brunetto Latini, who taught him uh, so much. And Latini does not cry out, are you here to Dante? But Dante cries out to Latini, what, are you here? You're, you're here in the realm, of, at this point, it would be the realm of the Sodomites. Um, so he's either expressing this surprise that Latini is in this particular realm, or just a surprise that he's in hell, and um, they begin to have a conversation in which Latini is talking uh, to Dante as though he's still his student, and, um, and as though he still needs to remember him and remember the great work that Latini wrote uh, when he returns to earth. And in a sense, that's what Dante does by recording Latini, but it's not really uplifting because he's remembering Latini in hell. And, and showing that if all you're concerned with is whether your work is going to last, that's, an, that's a hellish enterprise. Instead, it has to be something beyond that. Your work has to point higher than that. In Dante, it's very clear that Dante's work has to point towards God to be worthwhile, uh, to move someone towards paradise. And so I think we're meant to have that kind of resonance in our head when we're listening to these these lines between um, Eliot and an unknown first met stranger. I was still the same, knowing myself, yet being some other, and he a face still forming, yet the words sufficed to compel the recognition they preceded. 
Okay, and they begin to have this conversation um, with one another. And this conversation is about um, remembering, forgetting, um, praying, <laughs> right? Um, so with your own, pray to be forgiven. I pray to forgive both the bad and the good. Um, and drawing out from the past what is true and what is worth remembering and not forgetting those things. And recognizing in some ways that when poets write or when any writer writes, uh, what is true will be held on to and or should be held on to and that all the rest that is uh, not true will be burned away, right? That there will be a purgatorial fire of um, over their words and um, what will be left will be what is beautiful and true from what they accomplish. And I think Eliot, in a sense, is asking this of his own work uh, from the reader in the same way as he's remembering the work of other writers like Dante and Augustine and Pound here. The movement towards looking at history and drawing out the connections between Little Gidding and what was happening for Eliot during this time, between talking to the dead masters, um, bringing up these allusions to other writers and to their stories, I think becomes clear in Little Gidding what Eliot is doing with all these pieces. He writes, history may be servitude, history may be freedom. So we can be owned by our past and uh, submitted to a false vision of the way things were. We can become complicit if we don't revoke the sins of the past. We can also be so held and confined by what our past was that we don't know how to move into the future. Or history can also be freedom. It can be a way of learning from the past, the mistakes we made, and not doing them again in the future. Also, history can be freedom in the sense that um, understanding ourselves as part of a story that's continuing, right? Knowing that this is not just about our current moment. And I think that becomes clear in the number of times that Eliot returns to Julian of Norwich in this last section. Here's one of the intros to Julian. Sin is behovely, but all shall be well. All manner of things shall be well, right? Sin is necessary or was, has been necessary. Sin is something that is here. It is um, something that's almost inescapable, might be a better way of putting it, um, but all shall be well. Well, how can those two things both be true? We've seen paradox over and over again, trying to be explored in the quartets. Um, how can both of the ideas be true? Well, if we see them in the light of history and in the light of future, they are true. Maybe not everything turns out the way we want it. That does not mean that all shall not be well. All can still be well. And Eliot's going to return to this again and again, trying. Here he says, um, those who have died and been forgotten, those who are died that we have not forgotten, um, the old reign of the rose, the old factions, the old policies, um, the old wars. Here he's thinking of the English Civil, civil War which seems so long ago, um, where, of course, the people at that time would have been wondering why all this violence, why all this death, why are all these things happening? And yet, look, still, all shall be well. Um, the world continues. Beauty continues. Um, all manner of things shall be well. And in the same way that Eliot is trying to understand what's going on in World War II, and they're under fire and so much violence, he can still continue to say, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, right, when seen in the light of history and seen that there will be a future. Um, and part of this way of seeing is to recognize the vision of Kairos over the vision of Kronos, or to recognize the vision of Kairos, the timeless, touching the vision of time. This is the occupation of the saint. This is the occupation that Eliot hopes to receive here. And I think that we get to hear that in this passage in Movement 4, very short movement. I'm going to read the whole movement. The dove descending breaks the air with flame of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharge from sin and error. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of pyre of pyre, to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised the torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame. 
which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. The dove is the dove that was mentioned earlier. This is the Holy Spirit that descends and breaks the air in Burnt Norton, which was our element of air quartet. And we uh, saw the kingfishers catch fire in the air, um, the wings that bring forth the light, right? Breaking the air with flame of incandescent terror. We also have now the tongues of flame, um, the Pentecostal fire that comes with the dove. We have something greater than a muse. We have the Holy Spirit giving language to the poet uh, that will, will discharge from sin and air. The voice of the poet, the tongue of the poet, when the tongue uh, belongs to the Holy Spirit, that will set the world on fire in a good way, right? Offering more than hope or despair. So there are, there are there's a redemption that comes from fire, meaning a fire of damnation, by the purgatorial fire, right? Or the Pentecostal fire. So the choice for each person becomes whether or not to live by the violence of the world and the fires of the world, World War II, the English Civil War, uh, to live with the despair that was offered in Dry South Ages, right? To communicate with Mars and to um, barbiturate drugs and acids and uh, to be confused and lost and uh, not understanding Krishna, but trying to follow Krishna, just the, the lostness that comes um, with that way of living that will lead to fire, right? But a fire of damn damnation or to be consumed by the purgatorial fire and blessed by the Pentecostal fire would be the other option. And this is an interesting passage because it's now bringing in another voice to the conversation. Um, Eliot is one of the, uh, he's really the credited poet for discovering the metaphysical poets. Uh, John Donne and George Herbert were rather overlooked after their time. Uh, the British poets of the rom of Romantic Age, right, Her, um, Coleridge and Wordsworth or whatever, had little time for the metaphysical poets, and yet Eliot kind of revamped them. Um, in a sense, he, he brought them forward and said these are the kinds of poets within the tradition that he could respond to because they were Christian poets. And um, Herbert has this poem, Love Three, in which he writes, um, you know, love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back guilty of sin and dust, right? And so love is being a host here that is drawing um, the sinner in to himself and saying, don't you know that I made you? And the sinner is saying, but I marred my eyes. And um, love is saying, but I redeemed them. So sit and eat, right? Uh, the Eucharist being this kind of conclusion. Love is saying, eat me. Um, I'm giving myself to you. This is the self-surrender that Eliot was speaking about in Dry Self Ages now coming with a name, being personalized as love, right? So it's no longer the open-ended Buddha, uh, right, or Vishnu from Burt Norton, the possibilities of the unnamed God in Dry Self Ages, the Brown River God, um, but instead we have a personalized God that is love, that is Trinitarian, um, the incarnation, as mentioned earlier, all of that is kind of coming in, into being at the end of this poem. The last movement of the quartets returns us throughout the whole poem. We have to read everything together in this last movement, in this fifth movement. Um, what we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning this refers to East Coker, right? In the beginning is my end, in my end is the beginning. And we have a cycle going back, but it's not repetitive. It's an ascent, it's a spiraling upwards in the same way that we see in Dante's Divine Comedy in which the saints move upward uh, through a spiral. So it could look circular because it, it is, but it's circling in a, in a direction higher and higher, not just returning in upon itself, right? The end is where we start from, and every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, 
taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and new, the common word exact without vulgarity, the formal word precise but not pedantic, the complete consort dancing together. And we have this return from Bert Norton again of the dance. Um, the, the struggle with language has now been placed in this light of, of being at home, um, words having matter meaning by how they're contextualized and how they're seen within the whole. And um, and the end that is the beginning, uh, the word was with God and the word was God, of course, is um, in the beginning was God. <laughs> and so, so we have a, a newness um, being understood from John 1, um, referring to Genesis 1 and, and now um, Re -under understanding how God spoke the world into being with his words, how uh, God gave us the 10 words to follow, which of course are fulfilled. Both of those things are fulfilled in the word becoming flesh in God himself becoming man in the incarnation. And so it's a, it's a cycling back from what we've seen in the old Testament, um, but a newer, a newer, higher way in the life of Jesus. And uh, Elliot's bringing all of those resonances forth in this passage. Um, I'm going to pause, please, and move down. <laughs> the poem ends with the drawing of this love, the personalized love, and the voice of this calling. This is the voice that calls us to be saints, to understand how the timeless touches time. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. The journey is linear, but also circular, and more importantly, it becomes really a spiral upwards. Um, it is a move, chronos, through time from our childhood to our death, but also move upward towards God spiritually, and it's repetition. It is a uh, history itself has been cycling through us and will repeat, but hopefully in a new way. And the end, also theologically, um, God was our origin, was God. And so the end also is love and the beginning is love. And um, these things that we thought we knew, right? Imagine again, reading Genesis, you read Genesis in the beginning was the word and or in the beginning was God. And then when you read John in the beginning was the word, and suddenly you go back to reading Genesis and you read it differently this time than you did before. And so it becomes both more familiar, less familiar, you know the place, for the first time, even though you've been there before, through the unknown, unremembered gate, right? The gate that was mentioned into the first world in Burnt Norton. When the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, dry salve ages, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree not known, because not looked for, but heard, half heard, right? This is the hint, half guessed, the gift, half understood, the incarnation in the stillness between two waves of the sea, the liminal space, the breaking between the tides of time, quick now, here now, always, right? Um, history is now and England, it is not now and never and always. Um, both time present and time past and time future. A condition of complete simplicity costing not less than everything. And this is the definition of grace that is finally given to us at the end of this poem through which we can see everything clearly if we've received it, right? So it, it costs nothing because it's received, but it costs everything once you accept it because it transforms your entire existence. None of us had to pay the price because Jesus Christ accepted the cross on our behalf. 
But then when we accept his sacrifice, we then in turn take up our own crosses. Um, and this is why all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. When the tongues of flames are enfolded into the crown, not a fire, and the fire and the rose are one. And this, of course, is the vision that we receive at the end of the Divine Comedy. Um, when Dante enters the beatific vision and he's able to see heaven, um, what he sees is the this uh, this fire, this light, um, this this rose in which the saints are all drawing their nourishment from it in a light of dance uh, or dance of light and motion um, that is just it's beautiful all enfolding upon itself and yet and yet pouring outward as well. Um, the paradox that that Dante finds ineffable unable to explain in his poetry and yet tries. And that, of course, is what Eliot's trying to do, how to explain um, the love, the call, um, the gift of grace that costs not less than everything. And this is the beauty of the quartets, and it is a poetic knowledge I think we receive at the end, something that we want to read again, because we can hear the music and feel the music of the quartets. Um, we know things to be true because of how beautiful they are in this poem, the way that they draw out um, understanding from us, even though there's, there's also so much confusion, confusion and so many things we want to take apart and pick apart. And yet, um, hopefully at the end of, of the quartets, we are able to read them. <laughs> We're able to go back and read them from the beginning and to, to know them for the first time. <laughs>